It's my new book, Redemptive Kingdom Diversity, A Biblical Theology of the People of God, offers an accessible survey of the people of God from Genesis through Revelation by focusing on the concept of redemptive kingdom diversity, as is the case with any biblical survey. One cannot spend a lot of time engaging many texts at a critical, exegetical, and theological level, since the focus is to give a, an introductory survey of the material. In this lecture, I will discuss God's vertical, horizontal, and cosmic saving action in Christ, and I'll define those categories in a moment, by focusing specifically on Paul's epistle to the Galatians in relation to the work of the Spirit and redemptive kingdom diversity. For those of you who were in the lecture this morning, if this sounds familiar, that is because it is. Although here I'll provide more of an exegetical argument. And won't spend much time, frankly, talking about practical applications, but putting forward a biblical and theological framework that I hope can be helpful for you to think carefully about how to work this out in your own social locations, wherever you find yourself situated. Of course, I talk about Galatians and the importance of the Spirit in my book, but this lecture will privilege the role of the Spirit in God's saving action in Christ for Jews and Gentiles and to, to His accomplishment of redemptive kingdom diversity for ethnically diverse Jews and Gentiles and image bearers scattered throughout the world. So here's my thesis. My thesis in this lecture is, in Galatians, Paul presents Jesus' death and resurrection as the foundation to God's vertical, horizontal, and cosmic saving action in Christ for ethnically diverse Jews and Gentiles and for the cosmos. And Jesus' death and resurrection is the foundation for Paul's vision for redemptive kingdom diversity. By God's saving action in Christ, I refer to God's vision to fulfill all of his redemptive promises for Jews and Gentiles and for the world in Jesus. By God's vertical saving action in Christ, I mean God's work in Christ to convert Jews and Gentiles by faith in Christ. Justification by faith, for example, Galatians 2.16 would be one example of what I mean by the vertical relationship. That sinner's relationship with God has been rectified by faith in Christ. That the judgment is not guilty. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus by faith. Something vertically has changed. The unjust have now become the righteous ones in Christ. By God's horizontal saving action in Christ, I mean God's work in Christ to restore the horizontal relationships between Jews and Gentiles. And by God's cosmic saving action in Christ, I mean God's work to liberate, and don't be afraid of liberation, by the way, rightly understood in the Pauline sense of the term. God worked to liberate the entire creation from the power of sin and to create a new world. Galatians 6.15, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but a new creation. If you allow me for a moment to bring Romans 8 in, Paul talks about the entire creation awaiting the redemption for which Jesus Christ died. My argument to support this thesis is the following. Paul articulates God's vertical, horizontal, and cosmic saving action in Christ with apocalyptic language, with forensic language, and with salvation historical language in a letter that emphasizes the indwelling presence and power of the Spirit within Christ-following Jews and Gentiles. These three soteriological elements, vertical, horizontal, and cosmic, within Paul's soteriology in Galatians, provide the foundation to a biblical and theological vision for redemptive kingdom diversity, for ethnically diverse image bearers, in Paul's argument in the letter. But first, before I make my argument, let me define a couple of categories. What do I mean by redemptive kingdom 
diversity. I mean, quote, redemptive kingdom diversity, I'm quoting myself here, I'm sorry, I know it sounds so arrogant, but I'm just quoting a passage from my book. <laughs> I'm sorry, page one in the book. Redemptive kingdom diversity refers to God's work to crush the seed of the serpent by means of the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, so that all the redeemed people of God would live as transformed and spirit-empowered followers of Christ. The transformed people of God live in a broken world now in both the church and in society in anticipation of and a signpost of the redemption accomplished by Jesus as we walk in obedience to the gospel in the power of the Spirit. A redemption that we taste in part now, but that will be fully realized in the new heavens and the new earth. From Genesis to Revelation, we see that God has always intended to restore diverse humanity's vertical relationship with himself, diverse humanity's horizontal relationship with one another, and the entire creation through Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman." End quote. The rest of this lecture focuses on Galatians. But first, let me set my argument in its epistolary context in the letter. In my view, Galatians is a letter that Paul wrote to dissuade Gentile Christians from turning from his gospel, a gospel which focuses on the announcement that God has fulfilled all of his redemptive promises for Jews and Gentiles and for the world through Jesus Christ, God's Son. The teachers in Galatia were preaching a distorted message to these Galatian Gentile Christians, according to chapter 1, verse 7. Their message focused on circumcision and other works of the law as prerequisites for these Gentiles to perform before they could inherit the blessing of Abraham and become part of the people of God. Evidently, the teachers were gaining some converts in Galatia. Since Paul begins the letter expressing shock that the Galatians were turning so quickly from the one who called them by the grace of Christ to another gospel, chapter 1, verse 6, which he goes on to say is not another gospel at all, except some are troubling you and wanting to distort the gospel about Christ. He clarifies that point to emphasize there's only one gospel, only one good news. Rather, the opponent's message is a distortion of the true gospel of Christ. Paul later attacks the teachers and their distorted gospel by asserting that they have zeal for the Galatians' circumcised flesh because they want to save face in the Jewish community. It's chapter 4, verse 17. He criticizes them for their boasting in the Jewish community as a result of performing cultic circumcision, or at least the endeavor to perform cultic circumcision, on these Gentile Christians' uncircumcised flesh. Chapter 6, verses 12 through 13. Paul consequently wrote this letter with urgency. He is urgent in the letter to inform the Galatians when they received his gospel by faith through his apostolic gospel ministry that they had already begun to participate in and to experience every one of God's redemptive promises in Christ for Jews and Gentiles and for the cosmos because of their faith in Christ, chapters 3 and 4. One of those redemptive promises is the realization of the blessing of Abraham in their midst, which Paul identifies in Galatians 3.14 as the Spirit. The reason they participated in the Spirit and received the Spirit by faith is because Jesus is the seed of Abraham, who died for Jews and Gentiles. Yes, chapter 1, verse 4, to deliver them from the present evil age. Yes, chapter 3, verse 13, to redeem them from the curse of the law. But also chapter 3, verse 14, to give them the Spirit. So that the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise, which is the Spirit, in my translation, by faith. In Christ Jesus, by faith, Paul argues that these Galatians, too, are sons of God heirs of the promises to Abraham, and members of the seed of Abraham. Paul warns the Galatians if they give in to the teacher's distorted message, they forfeit the grace of God in Christ and will, inherit and will not inherit eternal life. That's why he gives these apostolic anathemas in 1 verses 8 
and 9. Paul's remarks about God's revelation of the resurrected and crucified Christ in, in, him are, in, in him in chapter 1, verses 15 and 16 are rooted in a real historical threat of apostasy in Galatia and in his apostolic urgency to defend his apostolic gospel authority and the superiority of his gospel over these troublemakers' distorted message so that the Galatians would in turn escape the curse of the present evil age and inherit eternal life. A curse which he argues would only lead to their eschatological destruction because of slavery to the present evil age. Paul refers to the revelation of God's Son in him so that he would announce Jesus as the good news amongst the Gentiles in chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. He goes on to say this announcement of good news to the Gentiles is the message, if believed by faith, that granted Jews and Gentiles membership in and made them participants of the full blessing of Abraham. So Paul, a Jew, a Jewish Christian, describes God's revelation of Jesus in him as both good news to be announced amongst the Gentiles and as a revelation about his son, the Jewish Messiah. Do you feel the multi-ethnic flavor to Paul's gospel as I say these things? This sonship language connects with Paul's earlier remarks in chapter 1, verse 1, that God the Father raised Jesus Christ from the dead, who is God's Son. Paul labels his vision of Jesus as a revelation about God's Son in chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. And this language is the language of exaltation and resurrection. Since the revelation God gave Paul of his Son was a vision of the resurrected and exalted Christ. God's revelation of his exalted Son in Paul caused Paul, the Jew, who formerly persecuted the Christian community, to participate in Jesus' death and resurrection by faith by the Spirit, by becoming crucified with Christ and living his life by faith in the Son of God who loved him, who gave himself for him, and who lives in him. And Paul's participation in Christ changed his redemptive vision with respect to the Gentiles. It was a vision that included Gentiles entering into the people of God as Gentiles by faith in Christ, along with fellow Jews by faith in Christ, without demanding either of those two groups to change their ethnic identity, but to live in light of the transformed power of the Spirit who transforms Gentile identity, transforms Jewish identity, but does not eradicate it in Christ. Does that make sense? So that's the context. Second point. I'm going to say a word about God's saving action in Christ and His apocalypse of the resurrected and crucified Christ in Galatians. An apocalyptic reading of Paul is complex. There are disagreements and various nuances by the numerous scholars who primarily read Paul through an apocalyptic lens or who some would identify as being part of the apocalyptic school. However, as J.P. Davies says, those scholars tend to, the apocalyptic school people, tend to rightly affirm, quote, an epistemology of revealed knowledge, the eschatological doctrine of the two ages, a cosmology characterized by two realms, and a soteriology which emphasizes divine victory, end quote. And you're, and you're saying, Dr. Williams, what are you talking about? Well, I'll explain that here in a moment. Yet as Davies points out in his book, engaging with the apocalyptic reading of Paul, apocalyptic scholars also wrongly downplay certain issues. They wrongly downplay or outright deny the presence of human agency, salvation history, the revelation of God's continued presence, and justification by faith in Christ. They tend to describe justification more as a liberation of creation. I assume that there are both similarities and strong discontinuities between Paul's apocalyptic soteriology in Galatians and 
and Jewish apocalyptic text. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection and because of Paul's participation in God's saving action in Christ by faith. And I assume that those who consider themselves as part of the so-called apocalyptic school are right about some things and wrong about other things with respect to Paul's soteriology. So for the purposes of this letter or this lecture, let me explain what I mean by apocalyptic soteriology in Galatians. I simply mean that Paul suggests that both individuals and the entire creation are enslaved to sin's power and to the present evil age. As a result, everything and everyone in the cosmos needs to be delivered, liberated from the present evil age and transferred into a new age because the entire creation, Jews, Gentiles, and everything else, is imprisoned under the power of sin. Now, let me just clarify something here. Unless you are Jewish today, you are a Gentile. We, we are the Gentiles. The Gentiles aren't those other people. We are those other people. Regardless of your skin color, regardless of your geographic context, regarding, regardless of, your, of your, your gender, male or female, regardless of... Uh, where you were born, nationality, unless you are Jewish, you are a Gentile, okay? So when I'm talking about Jews and Gentiles, I mean Gentiles, are, it would be everyone who's not Jewish and how I'm defining these categories for the purpose of this lecture. So the entire cosmos in Paul's soteriology is enslaved to sin's power. Sin is both original, we're conceived in sin in Pauline theology. Sin is a personal transgression in Paul's theology, but sin is also a cosmic power that enslaves us and rules over the creation as a, uh, as a tyrant rules over its slaves. Jews and Gentiles, therefore, need to be forensically justified by faith in Christ before God, redeemed and liberated from the curse of the law and from slavery to the present evil age. And we need to become part of Abraham's universal reconciled family through Christ so that we can freely choose to walk in step with the Spirit and love for one another in obedience to the gospel. The entire creation is enslaved within the present evil age and to the present evil age. This enslavement is cosmic. And it is oppressive bondage. The law itself is not a means for Paul by which sinners or the cosmos can be emancipated from the present evil age. Because in Galatians, Paul makes the argument the law itself is both part of the present evil age. The law is not evil. Romans 7 says it's good. But that's not his argument in Galatians. The law itself is trapped within the present evil age and it only places those under a curse who ascribe to it, Galatians 3.10. As many are from works of the law are under a curse, right? Deuteronomy 27.26 does not say that. It says those who do not subscribe to Torah are under a curse. Paul, in light of God's revelation of his son in him in Christ, reinterprets that text in light of Jesus and says the law cannot help you even if you identify with it. Both because you can't do what it says. That's implied in the argument in 310 to 14. But also because the law itself enslaves you to the present evil age and it is also trapped within the present evil age. That's why for Paul, Jesus comes 1-4 to deliver us from it. Does that make sense? God in Christ invaded the present evil age. Galatians 1, 4. Galatians 4, 5, and 6. To provide the vertical, horizontal, and cosmic redemption from sin's enslavement. All of that was defining what I mean by apocalyptic soteriology. Paul's soteriology in Galatians, further, more to the point, Paul's soteriology in Galatians is vertical, horizontal, and cosmic. It involves individual Jewish and Gentile sinners, 
Becoming right with God by faith. It also refers to these sinners' relationships becoming right with one another through Christ. It also refers to creation's full and complete restoration at the end of the age. Isaiah 65, 17 and following, which Paul basically summarizes in Galatians 6, verse 15. However, now here's a more precise point exegetically and theologically. However, justification, in my view, in Galatians, only refers to the vertical relationship between God and Jews and Gentiles who are justified by faith in Christ. One part of God's saving action in Christ, yes, is the creation receives liberation and resurrection because of Jesus' death and resurrection. A foretaste of this cosmic resurrection is, in fact, Jesus' physical resurrection from the dead. Isn't it interesting that Paul front loads the letter with the resurrection, not with the crucifixion, right? I think every time he refers to the crucifixion in the letter, he assumes the resurrection. But the point I'm making here is, is that in chapter 1, verse 1, he says that God raised Jesus from the dead. And then he moves into talking about Jesus dying for our sins. Well, historically, Jesus died, then was risen. But Paul starts with the exaltation and then works his way backward to the crucifixion in the first verses of the letter. As a foretaste of this cosmic resurrection is Jesus' physical resurrection and Paul's own resurrection to life in the present evil age and the life that all in Christ have in the Spirit because they receive the Spirit by faith. Christ lives because God the Father raised Him from the dead, physically raised Him from the dead. Jesus is exalted in bodily form at the right hand of God right now. Christ lives in Paul because of the indwelling presence and power of the Spirit by faith in Christ. And all who are justified by faith receive the Spirit and live by the Spirit because of God's vertical and horizontal saving action in Jesus. And all Jews and Gentiles in Christ, therefore, participate in God's saving action in Christ by faith in Christ and by the Spirit. Jews and Gentiles participate in liberation, resurrection, and new creation by individually, by individually being justified by faith in Christ because Jesus died for their sins to deliver them from the present evil age and God raised them from the dead. Evidence that Jews and Gentiles have participated in present liberation and in new creation right now in an already not yet tension, not contradiction, but tension, and that they will participate in future liberation and new creation is their current experience of the Spirit who lives in them and who works in them to create life and to help them freely choose to live in step with that life they have received by the Spirit by faith. What does Paul say in 524 and 25? He says, if you have life by the Spirit, that's my translation, by the way. Others might translate it differently. If you receive life by the Spirit, I think that's eternal life. Therefore, conduct your daily lives by means of the Spirit. God invasively disrupted the present evil age via the Incarnation and the death and resurrection of Jesus to accomplish his vertical, horizontal, and cosmic saving action in Christ for Jews and Gentiles and for the world. I'm getting this language of invasively uh, disrupting creation from apocalyptic scholars, not with whom I would agree on everything, but they're right about the fact that there is an apocalyptic element to Paul's soteriology, even if they don't work it out exactly the right way. Prior to this invasion, both individuals, I'm going to elaborate this on this point, both individuals and the entire creation were enslaved to the present evil age and to all of the spiritual powers opposing God within it. I think you get a hint at this in Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 through 10, where Paul says, look, if you Gentiles embrace the law, it's like going back to these, to these pagan ideologies that you embraced before you were a Christian. And he also talks about them being enslaved under the, this is the Greek phrase, the tostokeia to cosmu, which is hard to translate, but which seems to say something about these cosmic forces of evil that enslave those outside of Christ. Christ. 
God's invasive disruption of the present evil age via his saving action through Jesus' death and resurrection has begun the process of both individual forensic and cosmic salvation. Individuals participate in God's saving action in Christ and this cosmic renewal by justification by faith in Christ. As justified sons and daughters of God by faith in Christ, God gives us his spirit to walk in, to live by, and as the proof that cosmic renewal has already begun because of God's disruptive and invasive saving action in Jesus. I think that's in chapters 3 through 6 of the letter. I'll give you an example. As Paul was viciously seeking to destroy the church, in one life-altering moment, God apocalyptically, invasively disrupted and revealed his son in him so that he would announce Jesus as the good news. It's very important, he says, that God revealed his son in me, Hina, Uangalizomai, Alton, so that I would announce him, Alton, that is Jesus, as the good news amongst the Gentiles. Now, I expect amongst the Jews. He's the Jew. It makes sense for him to go to Jews. He said, no, that I, the Jew, would announce this as good news amongst the Gentiles. The result of this revelation in Paul was the belief that God, through Christ's death for Paul and his resurrection, would render both Jews and Gentiles not guilty in the judgment by faith and that God would liberate the cosmos from its enslavement to the present evil age. This revelation of God's Son in Paul was good news for Jews, but especially for Gentiles. And this revelation to him dramatically worked in him to change his perspective and his entire mindset toward the church, which at first was a small Jewish sect, right? It wasn't clear if Jews and Christians were different or the same very early in the Christian movement. But eventually there was a so-called parting of the, of the ways. Paul also was vigilant against the church's mindset toward the Gentiles so that in Christ, God retrospectively enabled him to retrospectively look back on his previous manner of life in Judaism apart from Christ and he realized that it did not lead to eternal life. Staggering. The revelation from God about Jesus and Paul caused an epistemological shift in Paul's thinking in a, in the, about God in the following way and about the Gentiles in the following way. His mindset about God's saving action for the world changed. His understanding of who Jesus was changed. His relationship to how he understood the righteousness of God changed. His understanding of Gentile participation and salvation in, in, his, in this age and in the age to come changed. The irrelevance of the role of the law and the moral agency and ethical transformation of Jews and Gentiles changed. Gentiles' participation with Jews in eternal life now and in the age to come by faith in Christ. Paul thought about that changed when he became a Christian and the renewal of the entire creation. How he thought God was going to renew the creation shifted in one apocalyptic moment. I think also there was a process of growth where Paul spent his whole life reflecting backward on what God revealed to him, trying to make sense of his previous manner of life in Judaism. So I don't think he got all of his theology right there on Damascus. But what I am saying is that there was an epistemological shift that took place when God apocalypsed him in Jesus. Just made up a word there. <laughs> Paul does not state in Galatians exactly when or where this revelation of Christ in him took place. However, based on Luke's narrative in Acts, Paul's remarks in Galatians 1, verses 13 through 16 likely refer to his Damascus Road experience. Luke states Paul's encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road was both a visual and audible revelation. Just read Acts 9, Acts 22. As he journeyed to Damascus in his efforts to incarcerate followers of the way, a light shined around him and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? In Acts 22, 6 to 21, Paul recounts this story while speaking to a crowd about Jesus of Nazareth. There he says that both he and his companions saw a light, but that only he heard the voice. 
In both accounts, the Lord convinces a man named Ananias to go to Paul and explain to him next steps once he arrived to Damascus. A key piece to Luke's discussion of Ananias' vision in Acts chapter 9 is he specifically mentions that Ananias tells Paul the Lord who appeared to him sent him so that Paul would see and so that he, quote, would be filled with the Holy Spirit, end quote, That's Acts 9, 17. Once Ananias uttered these words, things analogous to scales fell from Paul's eyes. Immediately thereafter, Paul was baptized and began to preach Christ in the synagogues. The Holy Spirit is not mentioned in Paul's encounter on the Damascus Road. As I've argued elsewhere, the Spirit was both present at Jesus' resurrection, Romans 1 verse 4, and Jesus died to give believing Jews and Gentiles the Spirit by faith, Galatians 3, 13 and 14, in chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Of course, neither Luke nor Paul says anything about the role of the Spirit in persuading Paul that Jesus was the risen and exalted Lord and Messiah. However, both Luke and Paul set Paul's Damascus Road experience in context where the Spirit is important to the messages each author presents in their respective contexts. So just notice connected to how I understand Paul's apocalyptic soteriology is the indwelling presence and power of the Spirit. You following my argument so far? Okay, I hope that silence doesn't mean no. <laughs> if it does, you can ask me questions or you can just buy my book that's coming out in 2023 on the Spirit in Galatians and read that. But hopefully we can get some clarity today. The Spirit appears for the first time in Galatians in chapter 3, verse 2, not in chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Yet Paul's description of the Damascus Road experience as God's revelation of his son in him, a Jew, resulted in his announcement of Jesus as the good news amongst the Gentiles, non-Jews. And this speaks directly to the impact God's revelation of his son in Paul had on Paul a revelation of which the Spirit was part. I'll give you some examples. For example, Paul tells the Corinthians, quote, God revealed to us by means of the Spirit. The deep things of God related to Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10. In the context of communal conflict due to, the, to division in the Corinthian assembly, Paul reminds the Corinthians the message he received and preached to them, he received from God by the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 11 and 12. Paul insists that he and his fellow missionaries speak by the Spirit, not with words taught by human wisdom. As he explains spiritual things to them with words taught to him by the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13. Because he received the Spirit of God instead of the Spirit of this world, Paul has the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, 16. The Spirit of God in Paul gives him and everyone who receives the Spirit the ability to understand the spiritual things given to them as a gift by God. They can discern spiritual things, for example, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13. But the fleshly man, that is, the man without the Spirit, or the woman without the Spirit, does not receive the spiritual things given by the Spirit of God because they are foolish to him or to her, because he is not able to understand them, since they must be spiritually assessed. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 14 and 15. So back to my point regarding Galatians. The Spirit is prominent in the central sections of the letter in Galatians chapters 3 and 4. As Paul discusses the pathway to the Abrahamic blessing, uh, is Christ, not Torah. Notice, by the way, in the central section of the letter, Galatians 3, in chapter 3, verse 2, Paul says, I only want to know one thing from you. How did you receive the Spirit? He doesn't say, how were you justified, although he talks about justification in chapter 3. He begins by saying, how did you receive the Spirit? And the Spirit permeates 3, 4, 5, and 6. And of course, justification is in 3, justification is also in 5, and of course, it occurs first in 2, 16. But my point here is to say is that one of the things he seems to be suggesting in the letter is, is that the pathway to the blessing of Abraham, that is the pathway to the Spirit and all of the Spirit's, the Spirit's spiritual resources is not by means of Torah, but by means of Christ, which you already have by faith. 
This is why, by the way, if I can just say something parenthetical that's not in the notes, this is why he calls them stupid in 3.1. Oh, foolish Galatians who bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as having been crucified. Have you lost? To quote one New Testament scholar, he thinks they have lost their spiritual minds to step away from Christ and to embrace works of law which only produces death, not life. Similar to Paul, the Galatians received the Spirit by faith. Even though Paul does not explicitly mention the Spirit in 1, 15 and 16, the Spirit's role in helping Paul grasp the revelation about Christ in 115 and 16 seems founded in the letter based on some things that I've already established regarding the, res- the revelation. In Galatians 1, 15 and 16, when Paul says God revealed his son in him, he identifies his experience as a defining moment for him when he made an epistemological shift in his thinking with respect to the good news about Jesus for non-Jews. As he says in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 through 16, God reveals to him and to other servants of Christ by the Spirit, and God helps them understand spiritual things, the deep things of God by the Spirit. Now, I want to linger here for a little more on Paul's apocalyptic soteriology. If I bored anybody to death yet? Don't answer that question. Hopefully not. <laughs> Hopefully you're following the argument. I'm an exegete, I'm not a social scientist, so I do exegesis and theological reflection, all right? So that's what I get paid to do for a living. So that's why I'm doing this. God invaded the world in Christ, in the incarnation. God in Christ invaded the world. Prior to this invasion, both individuals and the entire creation were enslaved to the present evil age and to all of the powerful forces of evil opposing God. It's a point I have made earlier throughout the lecture. And when Paul talks about God revealing his son in me, it's important that you hear my translation of that phrase, in and moi, in me. It was a revelation, yes, that was to Paul, but it was a revelation that was in him about the Son, who is the good news. That God revealed, 1, 15 and 16, his Son in him. God revealed, apocalypsi in the Greek text, revealed his Son in him to announce his Son as the good news. Just as God revealed in 1 Corinthians 2.10 spiritual things to us by the Spirit. Both the ESV and the RSV translate the phrase in a moi as in me. And that's 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 not the only way to translate it. Translate it. Or they translate it, excuse me, as as to me. Whereas the NASB and the NIV translate it as in me. Of course, the idea of in me and to me are closely connected. And in me does not discount that the revelation was given to Paul. Instead, the in me accentuates the apocalyptic nature of God's revelation to Paul. God, without being solicited, invasively broke into the present evil age, disrupted it, and revealed himself to Paul by the revelation about Jesus, his resurrected son. Paul did not pray a sinner's prayer to ask Jesus into his heart. God, without solicitation, broke into Paul's reality and transformed his epistemology by a revelation of his son that he is the exalted Messiah for Jews and Gentiles and for the world. This revelation, in, this revelation fundamentally did something in and to him to change his entire course of action and to alter dramatically his life as God was revealing the truth of his resurrected son in him as he was persecuting the church of God, seeking to destroy it. God disrupted that in Christ. And this revelation to and in Paul caused the churches in Judea, which only knew Paul as the persecutor of the church, to glorify God, I love this phrase, in him. In emoi, or in alto. Because they had heard that the former persecutor of the church was now preaching the faith that he formerly persecuted. This revelation in him was the turning point in his life. 
when Christ began to live in him. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul states that Christ is in believers. Christ lives in believers. And the Spirit dwells in believers by faith. In Galatians, Paul explicitly connects Christ in him with God's revelation of his resurrected and crucified Son in him. Paul also says because of Christ's death to redeem those under the law, they receive the Spirit by faith in accordance with the Spirit's power. The Spirit was active in and through God's revelation about the exalted Christ, compelling and convincing Paul by his indwelling presence and power in him that Jesus is in fact the Son of God. In other words, Paul did not just sit down and have a nice theological reflection one day and just come to this conclusion. God revealed something to him, and that revelation is connected to the Spirit. And by the way, the exalted Christ, the Spirit is present at the exaltation of Jesus, right? Romans chapter 1, verse 4, that God declared him to be the Son of God with power at the resurrection of the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, as Paul says it there. A few more remarks related to this, and I'll move on to my next point. How am I doing on time? I didn't do too well on time. Oh, I'm doing very well on time. Didn't do too well on time in the, in the class, but I'm doing well now. I have 15 more minutes to go, so I'm going to use those minutes wisely. Paul's remarks about God sending his son in the fullness of time to redeem us and to make us adopted members into his family support this point about Paul's experience of the Spirit on the Damascus Road. I could belabor that point, but I want to move to my number three point and talk about the forensic nature of God's saving action in Christ. Another important piece to God's saving action in Christ in Galatians is justification by faith. In the history of interpretation of Galatians, many interpreters have read Galatians as a defense of justification by faith. Of course, justification by faith is an important part of Paul's argument in the letter. To be sure, the teachers are compelling the Galatians to walk away from Paul's gospel and this would include a walk away from his teaching that Jews and Gentiles are justified by faith in Christ apart from the works of the law. But numerous Pauline scholars no longer read the letter as a defense of justification. In this part of the lecture, however, my intent is not to discuss the significance of justification by faith to Paul's argument in Galatians. Instead, my goal here is simply to make the argument that justified people walk in step with the Spirit while demonstrating that a faithful walk that is in step with the Spirit is not the same thing as justification by faith. Justification by faith and walking in the Spirit are both soteriological realities, but they are different soteriological realities. Just a few quick examples to support what I'm saying. Justification by faith is neither an abstract nor an isolated theological discussion in Galatians. Rather, it is integral to the reason Peter's behavior toward Gentile Christians is wrong in Antioch in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. Paul states three times that Jews and Gentiles are justified by faith in Christ apart from the works of the law. The typical verb that Paul uses for the, 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 the English translation that justifies the Greek term dikaiao. That's the term that pops up in Galatians 2, verse 16. This verb occurs in numerous places in the Septuagint, that is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and in the New Testament. In the Septuagint, dikaiao refers to someone being in the right. I have numerous texts cited here. If you want those, I can give them to you after the, the lecture. In legal context in the Septuagint, dikaiao refers to not acquitting the guilty in the context of a legal dispute. Of some sort. The verb also refers to a judge declaring righteous the innocent in a legal context, both when humans are the ones rendering the innocent to be not guilty, say, for example, Exodus 23, verse 7, and when God is the judge rendering justification to the innocent, like in Deuteronomy 25, verse 1. The verb occasionally refers to the Lord as being in the right for judging the guilty when they sin, LXX Psalm 50, verse 6, for example. With the exception of three occurrences by my count, Paul's use of dikaiao to justify always refers to God's act to declare sinners to be not guilty. 
Paul often explicitly states God as the grammatical subject of dikaiao, and he, he also, uh, and that he does, and that God does dikaiao, or he justifies on behalf of Jews and Gentiles by faith in Christ. The terms dikaiao, that's a verb to justify, and the noun dikaiasene, righteousness, in Galatians are in close proximity to the concept of life in Paul's letter to the Galatians. But in my view, in Galatians, justification is only one aspect of eternal life. That is, in my view, Paul uses the verb dikaiao in the language of justification in Galatians in a very narrow way. Namely, to state a positive verdict of not guilty given to Jews and Gentiles on the day of judgment by faith in Christ. This verdict has entered the present evil age right now for those of faith because of the indwelling presence and power of the Spirit. Paul says the law justifies no one and that the righteous one by faith shall live. Galatians 3 verse 11. In 3.11, the righteous one by faith is the one who is justified apart from the law, since Paul has already established in 2.16 that one is justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. In 3.11, notice this very carefully. This is an important, precise argument here. Paul does not say justification or righteousness is the totality of life. Similarly, in Galatians 3.21, Paul uses the noun dikaiosone, which is related in... in lexical uh, similarities with the verb dikaiao, and he also uses the verb to make alive, to give life, in the same context to assert that the law was not given to create life, and that if it was, then righteousness, dikaiosune, would come by means of Torah. Again, Paul places the concepts of righteousness and life in close proximity as he describes God's saving action in Christ apart from the works of the law. But he does not equate righteousness and life as either one and the same or as one as the expression of the other. I think Paul's basic point in 2.16 with the verb dikaiao is simply this. Jews and Gentiles in Christ receive God's eschatological verdict of not guilty right now in this present evil age by faith in Christ apart from the works of the law. Jews and Gentiles have Christ's righteousness reckoned to their account just as Abraham did in Galatians 3 verse 6 by faith. That because of what God has done for us in Christ in the cross of Jesus and in His resurrection, God renders to our account those of us who are sinners... He renders the verdict of not guilty because of our association with Jesus Christ by faith. Because Jesus participated in a life like ours. He was born under the law, under the power of sin, of a woman, born of a woman, to deliver us from the law. Likewise, we therefore receive the life that's promised in the law through our association with Christ by faith, not by works of law. You follow me? And Jesus, who perfectly obeys the law, receives the life promised in Torah because he was resurrected from the dead. He was given life. And that life spills over into our lives by faith, in our association with Jesus by faith, by the indwelling presence and power of the Spirit. And those of us who are recipients of the gift of God's forensic righteousness or justification, we receive that by faith. God counts us righteous in Christ. Justification, here's what I'm trying to argue. Justification in Galatians is always and only a forensic verdict ascribed to the account of the sinner by faith. It is never ascribed to the creation, but always ascribed to Jews and Gentiles by faith. Liberation is ascribed to creation as well as to individuals. But justification is ascribed to those who have faith in Jesus. Does that make sense? And justification is different from walking in the Spirit. Justified people prove they are justified by walking in the Spirit. Okay, I'm going to be more relaxed again now. Calm down here. All right. Don't want to scare anybody by raising my voice. 
In Galatians 3, 6, Paul uses a cognate noun, I've already mentioned it, dikaiosone, to describe a status reckoned to Abraham by faith. This idea of, of what we get theologically, this concept of imputation, it comes from not dikaiao. It comes from this idea of reckoning to one's account. And so Abraham, although in Abraham's justification before God, the full Christian sense of what that means is not spelled out for us in Genesis 15, 6. But Paul makes the argument in Galatians that Abraham serves, I think, as a paradigm for us to understand how we were made right with God. And that paradigm is by faith, not by works of law, because Abraham was, was basically a Gentile who was circumcised after he was justified, right? Justified in 15, circumcised in 17. Torah comes after Abraham is dead. And then Abraham's circum or the circumcision covenant is folded within the Mosaic covenant in Leviticus chapter 12, verse, verse 3. So just to summarize the point here, and I'll move to my final point and wrap it up. Just to be a fair scholar here, there is one place in Romans where the verb dikaiao is translated as liberation. Romans chapter 6, verse 7. It refers to being liberated from sin with the form of the verb dikaiao. And the context of this statement in Romans 6 supports Paul's, Paul uses the verb there to affirm some kind of liberative power from, from sin. But those who experience eternal life in Christ are liberated from the power of sin and they walk in the newness of this eternal life. Yes, and amen to that. But that doesn't mean that Paul's justification theology means liberation from sin's power. Just because he uses a verb that can be translated that way in one context, we don't want to read in a whole theological framework into how he's using a verb in one particular context apart from looking at the uses of these verbs and his argument in the letter as a whole. So if you look at Romans as a whole, he's using dikaiao and dikaiosone in many ways similar to how he's using it most of the time, he's using them most of the time as he's doing in Galatians. So to summarize the point about justification, you're justified by faith and justified people walk by the Spirit and prove their justification by means of that walk. That's why Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 5, we await the hope of dikaiosune, by the Spirit, by faith. Well, you've already said that we are justified by faith in 2.16. So what are we waiting for? We're waiting for the not yet reality of that justification. We are already justified right now by faith. And how do you know that? You have the Spirit living in your heart as proof of that. And what's true now by faith in Christ will be true on the last day when you stand before God in the judgment where God opens the books and each person will be judged in accordance with his or her works the verdict is going to be on our behalf, not guilty because of our association to Christ by faith. And we will have evidence, proof that that verdict is right because we have lived as justified people by the Spirit. Otherwise, how do you explain Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 610? when he commands us to walk in the Spirit, not to fulfill the lust of the flesh, and when he says, if you fulfill the lust of the flesh, you will not inherit the kingdom of God in 521, or in 6, 8, 9. Sow in the, in the Spirit reaps eternal life. Sowing in the flesh reaps eternal corruption. Does that make sense? Finally, say a word about a fourth and final point. Salvation, history, and God's cosmic saving action in Christ. Certain Pauline scholars tend to make the mistake of adopting an either-or reading of his letter to the Galatians. I'm a more both-and kind of a guy when I can be in terms of Pauline soteriology, not in terms of a whole lot of other things in this world. <laughs> From the so-called old perspective to the new perspective to the apocalyptic perspective to the anti-imperial perspective to the Paul within Judaism perspective of the letter, there are scholars who have not allowed for much nuance and balance and understanding Galatians and the soteriology therein and the connection between soteriology and redemptive kingdom diversity. Soteriological nuance in Galatians can actually shed light on redemptive kingdom diversity as it actually applies Paul's first century Jew-Gentile problem to the 21st century's race and ethnic problems. Space does not allow me to engage each of the, each of the above perspectives, 
mentioned for, for the purpose of my thesis, I've argued thus far that Paul describes God's saving action in Christ in Galatians as vertical, horizontal, and cosmic. And I've talked about apocalyptic and forensic soteriology in Paul. In what follows, I briefly say a word about the salvation historical aspect of Paul's soteriology. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 to chapter 4, verse 7, Paul makes a clear argument about the slavery under which the law places everyone. He argues with force that the law promised life, but it was never intended to be the pathway to life. Rather, the law was given on account of transgressions, he says, as a temporary garden until, until the moment when, in time when Jesus, the seed of Abraham, would come so that we would be justified by faith in Christ. That's Galatians 3, 19 to 24. Now that Jesus has come at a particular time in history or in the fullness of time, neither Jew nor Gentile Christians needs a guardian or need a guardian. By faith, we are all God's son in Christ. By guardian, Paul means we don't need the guardian of the law anymore to mark us off as the people of God because we have the spirit and faith in Christ to mark us off as the people of God. It doesn't mean there's no place for rightly understanding the role of Torah in the Christian life. I mean, you have Romans 7, law is good, perfect, and holy. And Paul talks elsewhere about the law is, is, is a good thing when it's used lawfully, right? But in Galatians, he's really trying to press this point that the Galatians have everything they need in Christ to live a life pleasing to God because in Christ they have the Spirit. And the Spirit is the means by which their alienation from God and from one another and from the creation is being reconciled in Christ. The result is that Jewish and Gentile Christ followers share in the Abrahamic blessing as Jewish and Gentile Christ followers. Neither ethnicity nor modern social constructs of race or social status grants Jews and Gentiles the blessing of Abraham or excludes them from it. Paul reiterates the temporary nature and function of the law in history in chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. He describes the life of Jews and Gentiles under the law's power as analogous to a child under a pedagogue in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. This child, Paul says, is similar to a slave until he reaches the age of maturity as the rightful heir. The child's father sets the proper age of maturity. Paul applies the analogy to life under the law. He says, in the same way, we ourselves were enslaved under the elementary principles of the world, the Tostoi Kea Tu Cosmu, when we were infants, by which he means when we were under Torah before Christ came. That's what he means. In context, the time of infancy to which Paul refers is the time prior to the coming of Christ when Jews and Gentiles were under the law. But Paul says, when the fullness of time came, God himself sent his son to become a Jew and to live under the power of the law so that he would redeem those under the law. The phrase fullness of time here is that specific moment in history appointed by God when God determined to invade and disrupt the present evil age by sending his son to die for our sins, 1-4, to deliver us from the present evil age, 1-4, to justify us by faith, 2-16, to redeem us from the curse of the law, 3-14, to give us the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit in which to walk, 314, 46, 516 to 610. To give us freedom, 51, 513. And to begin the process of cosmic restoration and renewal, 615. Paul uses much temporal, temporal language in 323 to 47 to support the salvation historical nature of God's saving action in Christ in Galatians. Paul says, before faith came, those under the law were held in bondage as slaves. Those under the law were also imprisoned until faith in Christ was revealed. The law was a pedagogue until Christ. But faith came after, but after faith came, those under the law were no longer slaves under the law. As long as an heir is an infant, he did not defer from the slave, Paul says. The pedagogue ruled over the child until the set time of the father. But when Jews and Gentiles were infants enslaved under the law and under the elementary principles of the world, they were kept in temporary custody by the guardian of the law. But when the fullness of time came, God sent his son to be a Jewish man under the same power of the Jewish law to redeem Jews and Gentiles and to make them sons and heirs who have the spirit. Thus, Paul describes God's vertical, horizontal, and cosmic saving action in Christ as apocalyptic, forensic, forensic, 
and salvation historical? When God acted in history to send his son to accomplish this salvation, that was the moment he likewise disrupted, invaded, and began the process of transforming the lives of Jews and Gentiles by means of the indwelling presence and power of the Spirit for all Jews and Gentiles who are justified by faith. And the moment when the inauguration of cosmic renewal began and a, a signpost of cosmic renewal is spirit-empowered, diverse, ethnic Christ followers loving one another in the power of the Spirit as they fulfill the whole law in Christ. Jews and Gentiles have both received the Spirit by faith and conduct their da daily lives by walking in step with the Spirit as an emblem of this new creation. So here's my concluding word here, for real. So in this lecture, I've argued that Jesus' death and resurrection are the foundation for a biblical and theological vision for redemptive kingdom diversity, for ethnically diverse image bearers. My argument to support my thesis was as follows. Paul articulates God's saving action in Christ for Jews and Gentiles and for the cosmos with apocalyptic language, with forensic language, and with salvation historical language. These three sociological realities within Paul's theology provide a key foundation to a biblical and theological vision for redemptive kingdom diversity. As a result, ethnically diverse image bearers in Christ can and must pursue redemptive kingdom diversity. And just so that you know, I don't mean pursue multi-ethnic church by that statement. Churches that are mono-ethnic are not off the hook. All Christians are called to love one another and their neighbors as themselves. That's not the optional track. Part of God's saving action in Christ is how you, yes, relate rightly to himself, but how you relate to your neighbors as yourself. As a result, it is my view that ethnically diverse image bearers, as I've said, can and must pursue redemptive kingdom diversity in ways consistent with their own context and rhythms in life as we preach, teach, obey, apply, and live out the gospel story where we live, work, worship, and play. And as we use common grace and common sense. My argument is not just preach the gospel. That is a, an easy way to be apathetic about the suffering of real people in the real world. Certainly you pre hear this for those of you who will watch this online so that you don't rip what I'm saying out of context. Certainly we preach the gospel, but you show me one place where Paul just preached it. He obeyed it. He lived it. So we preach it and we apply it. We teach it. We apply it. We obey it. We live it out in the power of the Spirit in ways that are consistent with our own social locations because we are real people who live in a real world of complexity and racialized complexity and ethnic complexities. So we must preach and teach, obey, apply, and live out the gospel story where we live, work, worship, and play as we use common sense and common grace, or else we will not inherit the kingdom of God. Thank you.